coffee really is amazing. Bristol on the southwest coast of England is a fiercely trendy city. It is best known as the home of the graffiti artist Banksy, the Bristol Balloon Fiesta, and Brunel's Clifton Suspension Bridge. The city streets are a stream of music, art supply, and fancy stationery shops. But I am not a trendy person. It's Bristol's history that I'm interested in, and I hope you are too. And to start us off, I want to play you the recording of the event that got me really interested in Bristol's history for the first time. I'm outside the Wills Memorial Building at the University of Bristol and it's on fire. There's smoke all over the street, places covered in police and the fire brigade. And Just a minute ago it was still, um, the bell was still ringing at the top of it. The Wills Memorial Building is this beautiful centerpiece building on one of the main streets in Bristol and it was not on fire. It just looked like it was. What was actually on fire was the School of Maths behind it called the Fry Building. Now, if you know your Bristol or your British chocolate well, you might be able to guess that the building is named after the Fry family and company. So Fry's produced the first chocolate bar in the world in 1847 as well as the first chocolate easter egg and has inundated us all with those things ever since and you can still buy a, a fries chocolate cream bar today even though the company merged with cadbury's just after the end of the first world war okay so i have a fries chocolate cream in my hands i hunted one down for the sake of this show um it says on the bar that it's Fry's Chocolate Cream since 1761, which I just looked up is the year when the shop, the first Fry's shop was bought. It's not when they first started making chocolate, though. And it has its little funny English thing on the back of it that says, by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen. So, okay, I'm going to give it a go. This is me opening this bar. Okay, well... Mmm, I don't know. It doesn't taste like all that much, really. It's like sort of jo dark chocolate that's vaguely sweet, but, um, yeah, I don't know about that filling. It has this kind of, what do they call it? They call it a smooth fondant center, but it's just kind of like white goo. Mmm, I don't know. I don't think I'm a big fan of this bar. Mmm, no. I do not like that. No. Remove the goo, is all I can say. Sorry, fries. Now, like a lot of buildings in Bristol, the Wills Memorial Building was funded, at least in part, by slave money. Henry Overton Wills III, a pompous name, after whom the building is named, uh, was the first chancellor of the University of Bristol, and his family wealth came from the tobacco industry. Now, in the 18th and 19th century, where there was tobacco, there were thousands of slaves who harvested it. Bristolians are all too aware that their picturesque seaside English city doesn't just have a wussy, indirect kind of connection to the slave trade. It wasn't just that Bristolians bought and sold slave-harvested tobacco, but that when a monopoly that had existed on slave trading and that was held by London's Royal African Company ended at the end of the 17th century, Bristol's merchants dove into that trade more enthusiastically than any other city. And for a time, they made Bristol the most prominent slave city in Britain, even surpassing London's investment in that horrific trade. Some historians have found evidence that Bristol's involvement goes back much further, having been conducted illegally, although the notion of illegal slave trading seems slightly offensive in suggesting that there is such a thing as legitimate slave trading. As early as 1655, 43 years before it became legal to transport slaves through ports outside of London, a letter was written in Barbados by a Samuel Drew, stating that he was willing to release a slave on the condition that he be provided a substitute slave by none other than Bristol's Vice Admiral William Penn, father of the William Penn who would have the US state of Pennsylvania named after him. And... Slave trading at this time may not have been confined to such personal trade. Interlopers, 
smaller trading vessels that anchored off more remote parts of the African coast, kind of slave pirates really, undercut the Royal African Company's trade. It is hard to estimate exactly how much involvement Bristol's merchants had in this kind of slave trade. However, the city of Spritestown, situated in an area of Barbados where illicit slave trading was rampant, was colloquially known as Little Bristol. How much of this went on, we'll never know, but it seems fair to say that slave trading was not altogether new to Bristol when it became legal. Leading Bristol's investment in the slave trade was the phenomenally named Society of Merchant Venturers. With a cool name and a cool coat of arms, have a look at it if you've never seen it, the merchant venturers were the most influential economic power in Bristol throughout the 16th and all the way through to the 19th century. Many of Bristol's uh, mayors, sheriffs and of course its preeminent merchants were members of the society and to a large extent the merchant venturers ran Bristol. They made wheels turn, they made ships sail and coins change hands. They had a pretty sizable impact not just on British but on world history. With the merchant venturers driving things, Bristol became one of Europe's great port cities and by the late 1400s, some pretty big deals were sailing out of Bristol Harbour. Some of the most interesting expeditions were launched from the city in the 1480s to find Brazil, not the one you're thinking of. This Brazil was spelt with an S instead of a Z and was not a country in South America, but a mythical Celtic island thought to exist somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, west of Ireland. Hi. According to Irish legend, Brazil uh, was invisible because it was shrouded in mist, except for one day every seven years, when the island became visible but still could not be reached. Searching for a mythical Celtic island turned out not to be a very good investment, but it did help establish Bristol as a harbour to the Atlantic. Now, with a lot of thanks to the merchant venturers, by the end of the 15th century, Bristol had become famous enough as a port city to attract a Venetian explorer named uh, John Cabot. Now, like his grander contemporary Christopher Columbus, Cabot had left Italy to find investors for Atlantic expeditions abroad. And while Columbus lobbied in Lisbon and Madrid, Cabot set his hopes on Bristol. So Cabot wanted to explore the uncharted lands to the west and to find a western passage to China and the Far East. With backing from the merchant venturers as well as Florentine bankers based in London, Cabot sailed from Bristol in 1497 after a failed attempt the previous year to cross the Atlantic. And on the 24th of June of that year, Cabot landed somewhere in North America that is popularly thought to have been Newfoundland in Canada. Now, as well as seeing John Cabot across the Atlantic, the merchant venturers funded the building of the Clifton Suspension Bridge, an absolutely amazing bridge. Have a look at a picture of it if you've never seen it, made by Brunel. They also funded the Great Western Railway, the University of Bristol, the University of the West of England, and the City College of Bristol, among other educational and charitable institutions. Um, the society actually still exists today, and its most recent major initiative was the opening of Venturers Academy, a school for students with autism, in 2016. Now back to slavery. If you read anything about slavery in Bristol, or just talk to people in the city about it, you're probably going to come across Edward Colston. So, an extremely controversial figure. Colston was a member of parliament, he was a merchant venturer, he was a philanthropist, he was a member of another kind of cool, or well, at least having a cool name company called the Worshipful Company of Mercers, basically egotistical cloth merchants, and notoriously he worked for what is arguably the most evil company that ever existed, which I've already mentioned, the Royal African Company, Slavers. On a side note, while I'm having my lunch of coffee and Toblerone, and I don't know if you can hear the rain beating off the roof of my Bristol apartment, um, I hope not. But there's one other thing I wanted to mention about the Royal African Company, that apparently the reason they lost their monopoly on slave trading was because an admiral that worked for the company named Robert Holmes attacked Dutch trading posts that were competing with the company along the African coast. This plunged England into a war with the Netherlands that the English would eventually lose and put the Royal African Company into crippling debt. Not that anyone is going to feel sorry for them. 
Now, Colston was not disconnected to this company. He was not just an investor or something like that. He was, he was a proper manager and uh, a deputy governor of the company. And even so, due to all the contributions that Colston made to institutions across Bristol, Colston's name is plastered all over the city. It includes Colston Tower, Colston Hall, Colston Avenue, Colston Street, Colston's Girls' School, Colston's School, Colston's Primary School, and Temple Colston's School. And he also has a type of bread named after him, the Colston Bun. Now, since the uh, 1990s, there has been a push to rename many of the buildings, institutions and streets that bear this slave trading philanthropist's legacy. But while these names have mostly remained unchanged, it's not because anyone in Bristol is proud of their city's history of slave trading. It's a lot like the arguments surrounding whether or not to tear down the Confederate statues in the US. On the one hand, you don't want to honour or glorify people who supported and profited from slavery. But on the other hand, removing and renaming Colston Hall or Colston Street can feel a little bit like whitewashing over a guilty history, which is in some ways more problematic than just leaving things the way they were. However, in the centre of Bristol, there is what seems to me to be an answer to this uncomfortable problem. And it's both depressing and kind of wonderful every time I see it. So in a plaza next to Bristol Harbour, there is a statue of Edward Colston. Now this statue is clearly honouring the man, although I think he looks a bit mopey. He's leaning on a staff and he's holding his head in one hand, but affixed as firmly as if it had been put on by whoever originally erected the statue is this plaque that comes across as a kind of middle finger up to Colston and to Bristol's involvement in slavery. The plaque is edged with the words unauthorised heritage and it says Bristol capital of the slave trade, 1730 to 1745. And below it reads, this commemorates the 12 million enslaved, of whom 6 million died as captives. And in some ways, I think the plaque is a better solution to the problem of how we should remember Colston, rather than simply tearing down the statue. An unfortunate update for you. So, I'm standing at the statue of Edward Colston right now, and the plaque has been removed. I can see the outline of where the unauthorised heritage plaque used to be, but someone's taken it away. And the statue looks so much the worse for it. I could not disagree with this more. It just, it looks terrible. And there's no record of what a bastard this guy was. Well, I don't know who it was. I'll have to look into it. But if it was Bristol City Council, bad move. Final word. Um, so it was Bristol City Council who removed the Edward Colston plaque. And apparently it's been gone since October. Not impressed, Bristol City Council. Thanks to Kevin MacLeod for providing the music for this. Um, it can be incredibly difficult trying to find good quality music for something like this. And Kevin's stuff is fantastic. You can find more of his music at his website listed in the description to this show.